Jesus, when he announced that it is finished, was talking about many things. He was talking about how our salvation, believers, how our salvation was completed. Anticipating the resurrection, we, the wrath had been absorbed, penalty of our, for our sin had been paid, we'd been set free from the bondage of sin and death and the power of Satan, and we were given hope in Christ Jesus. All of this took place upon the cross, and the cross was vindicated on the Easter Sunday morning, which we will celebrate at 8.30 this Sunday. The cross was vindicated by the resurrection, and the power of the resurrection through the ministry of the Holy Spirit was ultimately afforded the believers. We have noted this in Ephesians chapter 1, the power of the resurrection at work within us. So tonight we focus upon the cross. So let's pray together and we will lift up the name of Jesus in remembrance of such a wonderful and redeeming sacrifice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come into your presence and we ask, O oh Lord, that you would help us as we continue through this service of worship. Help us to forget about ourselves and the world's situations in which we find ourselves and to focus upon the Lord Jesus. We praise you, O oh God, in that the Lord Jesus, by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself has fully satisfied your justice. He has brought reconciliation, O oh Lord, between those who believe and you, O oh Father. He has brought us back into fellowship and we praise you in that the Lord Jesus purchased an everlasting inheritance in your kingdom, O oh God. For all who trust in Jesus, this is good news. So Lord, help us to reject the noise and the flashings of this age and to focus on such wonder as the cross. And let us, Lord, focus in such a way that this evening will be an encouragement to our souls and in the days ahead. May this evening and the word preached and the word sung and the word prayed and the word shown in the table, may all of these elements concert together to your glory and our benefit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. We will turn our attention now to the text and to the preaching of the word. If you'll turn with, in your Bibles with me to, to Matthew, uh, 40, Matthew uh, 27, we'll be reading 45 through uh, 54. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, Limi Sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is a calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, 
and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were also opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what had took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. had a, a, a Mac and, and you know you, we had to do papers and do word processing and to me that was just amazing that I don't have to go back and I can just go back and correct it I don't have to you know rewrite the whole thing again and, and again and again and they just went on and on about the Mac and I'm seeing as, as they just aggrandized Steve Jobs and made him into this just larger than life person and and they went through and, and they came to his funeral. Steve Jobs died of, I believe it was pancreatic cancer. And it just struck me, the people's reaction to, to his passing. It was similar to, I don't know if some of you remember when Princess Diana passed away. People just became apoplectic about Princess Diana passing away, which is a tragic thing, but people didn't even know her and people didn't even know Steve Jobs. But they just went... I mean, people were weeping, and, and, and they were just bringing flowers, and they were going on and on. And, and as I, I saw this, it made me think, as we're coming to Easter, I thought, how do, how are we, gonna, how do we celebrate our salvation and our Savior? You know, Jesus was God who took on the form of man to live among us, and, and he allowed himself to be crucified for our sins in order to pay a price of death that we rightly deserved. And I see... I, I work down in Anoka, and, and I see, as I'm driving, I see signs on the side of the roads, and, and one of the churches down there, they were advertising their, I think it was an Easter egg hunt. And it just struck me how sometimes people will trivially, trivialize, you know, what was done in our stead, and how important it is for us to, to take a moment when it comes to Good Friday and other times as well, and take a, take a time and say, what was done for us? You know, because invariably, when you do trivialize it, you're trivializing what Christ died for, which is our sins. And we can't afford to trivialize the debt that, that we rightly incurred. And so as we, we, tonight, we're going to take a look at the, the death of our Savior and what it means to us as, as believers. So let's, let's bow our heads and, and start out in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to come and worship to you tonight. Lord, and I just pray that we just clear our minds of, of all the extraneous things around us and help us to focus on what was done in our stead and the price that was paid. And I, I just ask that you help us to take a new, new appreciation at what you've done for us and, 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 and what you saved us from, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at to the narrative leading up to Jesus' crucifixion, we see that the, the, uh, he and the disciples have had the Last Supper, and as Jesus has explained to them, he's laid out to them what's, what's to come and what's going to happen and, and after he passes. And, and just as we're going to do tonight, he lays out how they're to remember what he did, uh, how my body was broken for you and my blood was shed. And he explained it to them. And we saw his triumphant, triumphal entry into Jerusalem. 
And then Jesus was arrested and tried, denied by Peter, beaten and placed on the cross. And our study is going to begin in, in verse 45 there. It's, we'll see the physical manifestations. As, as Jesus was being crucified, we, we saw the, the, the earth just crying out at the injustice. But we'll look at that, but more importantly, we're going to look at the, what Jesus endured for our sake and the, the things that we couldn't see, because a lot of times we, we look at the physical things that Christ went through, but not what he went through that we couldn't see. So it starts out, it, it says... From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, darkness came over the land. And as I, as I was going over this, I thought, people are going to try, and, people always try and explain these things away. They try and say, well, it was this, well, it was that. You know, a lot of times with anything miraculous in the Bible, it's tried to explain away. And I, and I thought about, a lot of you remember this, we had a, they might have said it was a uh, uh, eclipse. They might have said, well, it was an eclipse, or it was just really dark that day. And I thought, what's, what's the duration of an eclipse? Maybe 15, 20 minutes that it gets dark, a total darkness? This was for three hours. That was a three-hour darkness. So they, they couldn't explain it away. They couldn't say, oh, well, it was just some natural phenomenon. There is no natural phenomenon that gives you three hours of darkness. But the, what they would have probably understood this to be was it an, an act of judgment. Because God quite often showed us judgment through darkness. If you turn with me to Exodus 10, 21 to 22, this is a familiar passage of, if you remember, this is when uh, one of the plagues that, that God sent on to Egypt. In 10, 21, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt. A darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They could not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the people of Israel had light where they lived. So that, that was a, a, a sign of judgment. They could see that darkness was, was a sign of judgment. And just one more. If you turn to Amos 8 and 9. Amos 8, 8 and 9. Says, Shall not the land tremble on this account, and everyone mourn who dwells on it, and all of it rise like the Nile, and be tossed about, and to sink again like the Nile of Egypt? And on that day, declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon, and darken the earth in broad daylight. This was a physical sign that judgment was happening. They, they could feel the impending doom of, of darkness coming. So they, they knew that, that, that something was happening. And the, in verse 46, we see Jesus cry, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani. Again, it says, it says, translate, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as, if you turn with me to Matt, to Psalms uh, 21, 22, 1. This is David crying out. In verse, Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? This is probably over 800 years old, pointing towards the cross, pointing towards Christ dying on the cross and our salvation. This is not something that was an afterthought. This is all pointing. All throughout the Old Testament, it points towards the cross and, and towards Christ dying on the cross. Here we see the true horror. This is, this is where we're seeing the true horror of the crucifixion. It, we've seen, you know, movies have ma been made about the, the, the crucifixion. You remember, I think it was Passion of the Christ, and I've seen others, where they just show them, you know, ripped to shreds. And, and I thought, why, why is that? Why does society, why does Hollywood focus on that? And, and as, as I was preparing the sermon, it just made me think, you know, why? And, and it, something that kind of dawned on me is that that's something we might understand. We might understand physical pain. You know, I can understand what, not to that extent, not obviously not to that extent. I remember watching um, 
the old Spartacus with Kurt Douglas, you know, when I was a kid. And they showed at the end of that movie, you know, all the, the gladiators are being crucified, you know, rows of, of them being crucified. So this was a, an extremely barbaric device. But, you know, we understand what it's like to be, you know, any kid running through the weeds knows what it's like to, to run into a sticker patch. So you might be able to understand what thorns on your brow feel like. You understand what, you know, needles being poked into your skin. We understand, you know, piercing of skin and things like that. And, and people like to glorify that. I remember, young, you know, years ago, I, I don't know if they still do it, but they would take and, and reenact the crucifixion complete with being nailed to the cross. You know, and that's what they were glorifying was this physical torment, which is horrible. It's just horrible. But I think that's what people understand. I understand that pain. But what we don't understand is that Jesus was being in desolation from the Father. If, turn with me to, to Matthew eleven twenty seven. Jesus and the Father, they had a bond that was difficult, if not uh, impossible, to fully comprehend. You know, you, you might be able to somewhat try and understand it, but I, I don't think fully. I think about when you see spouses that have been married for 30, 40, 50 years, and one passes away. And I mean, you know, when Christ says that we're intertwined, we under, you know, a married person understands that. You know, I understand that, you know, Chrissy and I, I know what she's going to think, and she knows what I'm going to think. But that doesn't even compare to the, to the relationship that Christ had. If you look at Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, we'll read 25 through, through 27 for context. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yet, Father, for such was the gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal to him. This is where we start to understand the horror, the sheer horror that Jesus was, was going through. Obviously, there was physical torment, but he was being, understanding true loneliness from the Father at, at this moment. And he was, we also need to realize at this point, he was simultaneously taking on the sin of the church, world past and present, but he was experiencing desolation from the Father. This was a new experience to Jesus. He had never felt alone. He always had the Father with him, even, even down here. He felt totally alone, taking on our sin. And again, we need to... This was someone who had never committed one sinful act or had one sinful thought, but he was, he was being this put onto him. This is a Savior who Paul reminds us in Philippians Turn with me to, to Philippians 2, 6 through 9. I apologize for having you go all over, but I think it's important. Philippians 2, 6 through 9. Starting in verse 5. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So we start to understand that Jesus took on our sin. He humbled himself, and he became obedient. He was a servant to us. He became a servant and he became obedient even to death on a cross. And again, Paul reminds us that uh, what Jesus endured in, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, again, Jesus knew no sin. He had never committed one sinful act. But for our sake, 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Here was Jesus enduring something that he had never known, the judgment for sin, as well as desolation from the Father. 
He provided the perfect sacrifice satisfying the payment of death. It's interesting how offended we become when our character is impugned, when somehow our character is drawn into question. And it's like, who are you to question me? And I think the, the utter injustice that Christ endured for our sake, the person who lived the perfect life but took on our sin, took on our iniquity. And I, it was in, I looked up iniquity and it was like gross in, uh, injustice or gross, gross sin. And I think this is Christ who took that on in our stead. If you turn, again, in the, in the Old Testament, Isaiah points towards a cross and he points towards what Christ was going to do in our stead. Turn to Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. And again, remember, this was written about 700 years before Christ was born. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like that a sheep before his shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man his death, in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When a soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a por- divide him a portion with many, with the many, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And as we look at that, we certainly can't be exhaustive, you know, as to what Isaiah was pointing at and and, and what Isaiah revealed to us, but. In verse 5, we see that he was wounded for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities in verse 5. In verse 6, it says, he laid on him the iniquities of the world. And in verse 4, he bore the sins of many. And what does that mean to us? What, what does that, how does that pertain to us? It, it, what it means to the believer is that upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. In verse 1, we have peace now. That's something unheard of in this day and age. We have peace with, you listen to the news, and it's, it's just chaos raging around us, but we as Christians have peace because of what Christ did. In verse 5, by his stripes we're healed. Healed from what? What are we healed from? We're healed from our sin. Each one of us were, was born in sin, and we have a, a terminal condition called sin, and Christ heals us from that. And, he, and finally, in verse 12, it says, he makes intercession for the transgressors. In, in transgressors. The transgressors, that's us. We're the transgressors. And we, as we look at that, we can't forget that, what, that Jesus did that while we were yet sinners. In Romans 5, 8, it says, but God, but God showed his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. 
he didn't wait for us to, to get our act around. You know, that's the way we act. If, if I'll start treating them better when, they're, when they get it together. When they start to realize how, how bad they treated me, then I'll, then I'll forgive them. Then I'll, he, he didn't wait for us to, to get our act together. He died while we were yet sinners. And as he suffered this, this torment of sep separation, coupled with a physical torment, moving on, we see, we see that some of the bystanders, they thought he was calling for Elijah when he, when, he was, when he was crying out. So they offered him some sour wine on a reed. You know, this wasn't done in compassion. This was not some compassionate thing meant to, to, to sate his thirst or anything like that. This was in a form of derision. I mean... I don't know if you've ever tasted vinegar outside of a pickle. It, it tastes horrible, and it's not meant to, 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 it was not meant as a help. It might have been a vinegar mixture that soldiers might have drunk just to, to get by, but it wasn't, certainly wasn't meant as a help. But at this point, Jesus cried out again and yielded up his spirit. And it, we need to, we need to certainly look at that. Jesus yielded up his spirit. His spirit wasn't taken from him. Just as God is sovereign, just as God was sovereign in life, God was sovereign in death. God gave his life up for us. It was not taken from him. He was, he was not killed out of his own will. He was, as, as we saw in Isaiah, he was given up as a, as a sacrifice for us. And he allowed himself to be crucified in our stead. And if we look at... Uh, Turn with me to John 19, 20 to 30. That, that's another account of, of the death of Jesus. John 19, 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received some of the wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus gave up his spirit. And, and, and we see that it, it wasn't, some again, that something that was taken. Jesus gave it up of his own accord. And as a perfect lamb of God died, the ground shook at the injustice. Think of that, that, that the earth has gone dark. That they've now seen the earth go dark. And the ground shook. In that area, it's not real well known for earthquakes. So this would have been a new experience for them as well. So they had to be thinking, what in the world is going on? That we're crucifying this person. The, ground, the, the sky is dark and now the, the, the ground is shook. And it said that the curtain was split from the top to bottom. And obviously we can't overlook the significance of that. The temple, the temple curtain, if, if you remember, it was the, the curtain or curtains that separated the most holy place from the courtyard. God was, was, didn't allow just the common man to come in and, and offer sacrifice. It, the, the priest had to prepare himself and go through certain things to be able to even come in and, and sacrifice. But now that was open to us, and, and that, that curtain was split. It separated, it, it was split in half. And turn with me... To, to look at the significance of that, turn to Hebrews 10. The writer of Hebrews tells us what that means to the believer. Hebrews 10, 19 to 23. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us, through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure, pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. We now have a high priest who stands in our stead and, and intercedes for us is a few years back I was talking to um, a fellow at work and he was talking about one of, his, one of his bosses. And I thought, and he said, well, he's, he's no advocate for me. He won't stand up for me. And it, and it just struck me that we have an advocate. We have an advocate, and the advocate is Jesus Christ. Christ, 
stands in our stead and, and only by his blood can we be made righteous. All we have to put our faith in, in is, is the blood of Christ. And through the, the curtain being split, we now have direct access to the Father through Jesus Christ, like I said. And then just praise the Lord to that. As we celebrate to, and as we, we come tonight, think of that, that. That apart from Christ, we now have a, or through Christ we have access. And drawing to a close, as we close, let's ask ourselves, you know, to myself as well, what are we allowing us to take our focus? What are we allowing ourselves to take our focus from what was done and accomplished by Christ on the cross? I see, um, as I talk to people coming up to Easter and Good Friday, people get so busy in different things and they get so drawn to, to different traditions and, and this and this, and, and, and they're not necessarily terrible. But are we focusing on what, what are we celebrating today? And, and, and I feel awkward saying celebrating. It, this is a... This is an awkward, ho awkward holiday, so to speak, because we're celebrating the death of Christ, and it sounds like, like such a morbid thing that we're celebrating the death of someone. But we're celebrating the death of someone who gave his life for us and paid the price, and, and that's what we're celebrating. It sounds twisted. And, you know, I've heard people say, I was listening to an interview, I was talking with Ivan about it, and people try and rewrite what the crucifixion was. This, he, he wrote a book on how Christ being crucified on the cross wasn't about uh, the payment for salvation, but it was Christ starting a revolution for the, the world. And it, and it was just diluting the fact. And, and he, he compared to the death of Christ as a bloodthirsty God demanding some uh, wrongful payment from his son. Just, it was just hypocrisy, just, just utter nonsense. But that's what people are trying to, to substitute the gospel with. They're trying to substitute the fact that you and I are sinners saved by grace and we have nothing else than what Christ did on the cross. That's the only thing we have faith in. And it, and it just strikes me how people are trying to, to strip away what Christ did on the cross. Number two, are we living our lives in appreciation for what Christ did on the cross? And are we in realization that we've been bought with a price? I won't ask you to turn to it, but 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, and that you, within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you have been bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You and I have been bought with a price. What, what's the price? The price is God's blood shed on the cross. That's a hefty price that was paid for you and I. And if you put your faith in Christ, that's the price that was paid for your, your and my salvation. And we need to realize that, that, that this is not some trivial thing that's, that's to be set aside and, and just passed over. We need to remember this, that, that we have been bought with a price. And finally, are you thanking and praising God each day for the fact that he paid the price of washing away our sins. And I'm going to pause there. Sometimes we hear these phrases and, and we take, take them for granted. Washing away our sins. Our sins are gone. They're, they're, they are no more. God doesn't remember sins. He's not like you and I. I. I wish I could forgive and forget. I can't. God can. And he washes away our sins. Removing the veil of sin that separates us from God and then further, before we close, just consider this, that the only reason we have access to the Father is through Jesus and what he did on the cross. We have no merit of our own and deserve nothing but hell apart from Christ. So as we, as we look to that, remember that, that we deserve nothing but hell. But what Christ did on the cross saved us. And the fact, too, as, as Ivan's going to preach on Sunday, it doesn't end there. Jesus rose again. Jesus was, died and was buried. It wasn't some sleight of hand. Jesus died and was buried, and he came back to life again. He, was, he rose again, defeating death once and for all, for you and I. And, and by him raising, being raised from the dead, or coming back from the dead, 
that defeats, that's hope for us, that we no longer have to fear death either. And so it, it, just as, as we close tonight, remember the price that was paid for our salvation. And I, and I just, this is for me too, that I, I just, it, it strikes me how sometimes we, we take things for granted, and this is one thing that we can't take for granted. So let's close in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for the gift that was given and the price that was paid. Lord, I thank you for your servants, and I thank you, Lord, for the fact that you came and paid the price that none of us could pay. And I pray, Lord, that we never, ever forget that, and I pray that we just constantly remember the, why the price had to be paid, that it was our sin that put you on the cross, and that just help us to remember that it's, it's something that we need to praise you daily for, in Jesus' name, amen.